Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining me for today's event. I'm Scott Storey, Head of UK Operations uh, of the Centre, and my role today is to facilitate our webinar, The Climate Emergency, Contributing to Change and Locally and Strategically. We've got around 45 minutes of information to share with you today, after which we'll have some additional time to take questions. As we go through today, please do add any questions that come to mind in the Q&A section, which you can access from the bottom towards the bottom of your screen. You can also chat with us and your fellow attendees via the chat button or window. I have some colleagues online with me today as well who will be monitoring that chat area. So if you do have any issues, please let us know and we'll do what we can to try and assist. Finally, as is the case with all of our webinars, today's event is being recorded and we'll make that recording available to everyone who registered and or attended within the next few days. Our panel for today's webinar is Brendan Day, the Secretary of the Federation of Burial and Cremation Authorities. The FBCA represents 80% of crematoria across the UK, along with cemeteries. Previously, Brendan worked in local authorities for 37 years, managing cemeteries, crematoria, coroners, registrars and other services. Brendan is a director of Cameo, the only national mercury abatement scheme in the UK, and is a fellow of the Institute of Cemetery and Crematorium Management, ICCM, where he has held several senior positions. We're also joined by John Cross, uh, John is a fellow of the Institute of Directors and the Managing Director of S&J Associates, a consultancy specialising in working on innovation between the public and private sectors. Focused on business performance, recovery and turnarounds, he has a passion for developing solutions to emerging issues, having spent many years working alongside local authorities in a senior capacity, he recognised several options and opportunities to build upon the services they provide by developing advantageous collaborations. Most recently, he's dedicated the last five years to the bereavement sector, assisting a number of organisations to address specific challenges and creating new opportunities. Currently, alongside other projects, he is facilitating the newly established Collaborative Environmental Stewardship Group, where the Cremation Society of Great Britain, the ICCM, the FBCA and the CDS Group uh, come together to lead the sector in responding to the challenges of the climate emergency. <coughs> and finally, Julie. Julie Dunk uh, started her professional life as an archeologist working mainly in York in the North of England. During this time, she developed an interest in Victorian cemeteries and worked on an international project to record the memorials in the Protestant cemetery in Rome. Julie went on to work on research projects at the University of York, looking at policies for disused burial grounds. The research involved visiting many cemeteries and crematoria through the UK, and Julie decided that cemetery and crematorium management was the profession for her. Um, throughout her second career, Julie was actively involved in her professional association, the ICCM, serving as director and president, as well as organising events for them. In 2008, Julie left Bournemouth Council to work for the ICCM full time as a technical services and events manager. In 2017, Julie was appointed Deputy Chief Exec, followed in 2018 by her appointment as Chief Executive. In the past 13 years, Julie has provided management cover and support to several burial and cremation authorities from private companies around the UK, as well as delivering training, developing policies, organising conferences and seminars, and providing technical support and guidance to those working in the bereavement services sector. Julie now heads up the ICCM team of dedicated and hardworking offices whose aim is to improve the provision of bereavement services through training, education, best practice guidance and consultancies. It's fair to say that nature is definitely setting the agenda for this decade, opening with the global pandemic. And the pandemic did several things for modern society. It highlighted the weaknesses in our infrastructure it accelerated our adoption of technology to continue to operate while staying at home. It demonstrated that when given no other options, all nations can collaborate to come up with solutions for a global issue in a relatively short time period. COP26 is scheduled for November 2021, only 33 weeks away. And this decade is pivotal in the response to climate change. 
Now we need to work together to meet this ever-present challenge. But what is the challenge? The Paris Agreement signed in 2015 set out to reduce modern society's impact on global warming. The objective is to minimize global warming to less than a two degree increase over the next 80 years. Further, the UK government has passed new laws to reduce emissions to net zero by 2050, so 29 years. To achieve this collectively, we need to achieve reductions between 7.7 .7 and 11.7 .7 per annum, starting now. Uh, these reductions are not just the UK targets. These are targets for every country in the world. Current UK reported figures show our decarbonisation rate at 4%. But if we have a 10% compound reduction, as assumed, this means a reduction of 65% in CO2 emissions by 2030. In simple terms, what do we need to do? We need to increase our skills and knowledge with regard to the environment. We need to engage with staff and clients and educate them. We need to implement environmental policies and consider the environment with all commercial decisions. We need to encourage biodiversity. We need to protect flora, fauna and wildlife. We need to use our protected green spaces of cemeteries, memorial gardens and parks to actively promote natural ecosystems. We need to utilise technology to best effect to protect our environment, everything from virtual meetings, live streaming services, smart metering and cloud services to recharging stations all have a positive impact on the environment if used correctly. We need to do more with less. Introduce heat exchanges to good effect to capture emissions, use green air energy sources, harvesting rainwater or solar energy all will help. We need to reduce our overall energy consumption as well as reduce harmful emissions from our activities. So there's a lot to do. And on the 1st of March 2021, the FBCA, ICCM, the Cremation Society and CDS Group formed the Environmental Stewardship Group to work with everyone in the sector to highlight the current position and develop strategies to help, the address, help address the issues first. So now let me hand over to Brendan Day from the FBCA to talk about these challenges in more detail. Brendan. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. And can I also take the opportunity to thank Open Centre for partnering on the delivery of this series of environmental webinars. Good morning, everybody. And I'd like to start today, a briefly talk about uh, carbon footprint and the process guidance notes. In the last 30 years, crematory have undergone a step change with the development of cremators and the control of emissions. That change has been driven by the statutory process guidance notes, BG 5.12.2. Next slide, please, Scott. For abated crematoria, the process guidance note set emission limits on a range of pollutants, which is set out on the slide. The sector has gone a long way as a result of introducing computer controlled cremators and abatement equipment. Somewhere between 75 and 80% of UK crematoria are now abated. We will have figures on that uh, in a couple of months time. We are all very much aware of these requirements and up and down the country, emission limits are being achieved with excellent equipment. What is not on that list is the carbon footprint of the facility, which might appear strange because as John will make clear in his presentation shortly, Reducing the production of carbon is central to avoiding the climate crisis. However, the statutory process guidance notes do specifically refer to the carbon footprint of crematoria. Next slide, please, Scott. As we can see, section 4.34 of the notes is dedicated to gas usage, carbon dioxide emissions, and the carbon footprint of crematoria. Yet as a sector, it is something we have not grasped to the same extent as abating the emissions already mentioned. 
The section commences with an explanation of the carbon footprint and then goes on to identify the primary fuel source of cremation in the UK, gas, as the main contributor to the carbon footprint of the crematorium. I'm sure that will not come as a surprise to most crematorium managers. However, if we now move to the next slide, What may come as a surprise to some managers and regulators is the requirement that within three months of the publication of the guidance notes, operators should have commenced recording gas consumption and using the conversion factor which is available on the DEFRA website to convert the result into a CO2 equivalent. The regulators should then be inspecting the results. So what is the purpose of recording this information? Simple recording of gas consumption is explained in the guidance notes as being the first step in managing energy usage and therefore CO2 emissions. It also places an expectation on regulators to make this a condition of the operating permit. I wonder as a sector, are we actively managing our energy usage as well as we could. Are we developing and adopting energy reduction strategies to reduce the carbon footprint of our crematoria and save money on gas and gas, sorry, on gas consumption? The process guidance notes go on to expand on the need for environmental awareness in section 5.47. Next slide, please, Scott. The notes say that effective management is essential to environmental performance. I wonder how many of us have effective management systems in place to deliver good environmental performance. Have you established objectives, set targets, measured progress, and revised the objectives according to results, as the guidance note states? The final slide, please, Scott. The process notes make it clear that it is desirable to adopt a structured management approach, adopting standards such as ISO 14000, which supports organisations to manage their environmental responsibilities or creating a management system tailored to the size of the process. The Federation is making available to its members an environmental awareness report tool as part of its compliance scheme later this month. This will help provide a baseline of where crematoria are regarding environmental issues. Building on that, cremation authorities should consider developing their own more detailed environmental plans. In conclusion, it is clear that as a sector, we have made great strides in emission controls from where we were prior to the guidance notes being introduced. However, as a sector, we may not have made the progress necessary in relation to the carbon footprint of our facilities. I'm sure the need for the sector to focus on our carbon footprint more acutely will become clear from John's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Cross, who was going to explain more about the role of the ESG. John. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. Thank you ever so much for allowing us the time to explain a little bit more about the Environmental Stewardship Group. Um, this first slide um, perhaps is not as, uh, as rare as we like to think, and it's partially due to situations like this that the uh, Environmental Stewardship Group uh, was formed. Next slide, please. So let me tell you about the ESG. Um, you've already heard the, the core members of this group. They came together in September and we discussed the issues about the sector's environment, uh, sector's impact on the environment, sorry, and particularly in relation to the climate emergency. And with over 75% of local authorities declaring an emergency, um, we felt it appropriate that we really did need to act. 
So in November 20, we agreed to start raising that awareness. And we recognized that in order to do this activity, we needed to be involving all the key constituents across the sector. We also recognize it's large, it's complex, it's bounded by sensitivity, there are traditional elements in it, and a common theme that we've come across obviously is about resistance to change. But nevertheless, this is the actions that we're going to take. Next slide, please. Looking at the highest level uh, on the sector, um, You'll be pleased to see that owner operators are right in the centre of this diagram. That's because they have the largest interface with the other elements of the sector. Government departments um, as a sector, we have interfaces with more than just one uh, department. In fact, we have interfaces with more like five, six or seven. Uh, funeral directors and suppliers. But ultimately, owner operators at the centre actually carry a significant part of the solution that we're working towards. And the Environmental Stewardship Group wants to support all of these sectors. Next slide, please. So what are our objectives? Very simple, to protect the environment, to promote continuous improvement, to shape regulatory requirements and to communicate the commitment we have as a sector. But in order to do that, we need to understand where the sector currently stands. Next slide, please. So we recognise that it's a large topic and we decided to set a year zero activity. This means we're going to take time out to effectively engage with as many people as we can from the sectors that you saw on the last slide. So by setting up a number of roundtable groupings, we're able to identify what they know about the emergency, where they're at in their own business, what help do they require, and where do they want to be in years to come. So we're exploring the topics such as net zero, which is commonly heard now, the implications on business and the solutions, and predominantly quite a bit about behavioural change as well. But it's important to say that as we operate under Chatham House rules, feedbacks and comments are non-attributable unless specifically authorised to do so. Next slide, please. So between March and September, we're going to take 12 sessions in total. Um, the first one happened yesterday. The next one happens tomorrow. So yesterday we had owner operators. Tomorrow we've got funeral directors. And then it will be the turn of government and then on to um, suppliers. So we're going to use the feedback from these activities so that in uh, between mid-September and mid-October, will be generating the findings in the form of a report. And then in late October, we're going to publish that report with recommendations on the next steps in leading this industry to sustainability. And that report will be published during a press event time just prior to the opening of COP26, um, which will help to engage and show how much we are doing uh, and taking responsibility. And you'll find um, quite a lot of information being updated daily on the Environmental Stewardship Group website, which is, as you can see there, www.environmentalstewardshipgroup.org.uk. Next slide, please. And you can go on again, please. Thank you. Right, as you can see here, this is very simple. It's showing in the last 60 years just how the UK has actually warmed up. And as you can see, moving from 
blue, which is the trend um, where things are getting slightly cooler in a few places in Scotland to the hottest places which are around Dover in Kent. And that's just happened in the last 60 years. But this is an indication of how the global warming is starting to affect um, particularly our climate. Next slide, please. Now, so what are we doing about it? We've been told uh, and advised that we need to keep any changes under two degrees. If you look at the salmon colored uh, top line, you're getting that's what we need to do to achieve managing emissions globally to keep things down below 2%, uh, 2 degrees. If you look at the middle line, the blue one, you're starting to look at how things are going on a 1.5% medium. But you can see where the UK flag is, that is our target for 2050. And please bear in mind that we are the first country in the world to legislate to meet net zero carbon by 2050. Next slide, please. So this kind of gives you an idea about abatement and what people are trying to do to make the impact that's required. And this is about metric tons of CO2 emissions. And how people are going around that is they're looking at how we can reduce the demand and improve the efficiency in terms of our carbon intensive activities. And that's about reducing the demand, particularly of fossil fuels, and looking at greater efficiency in the use of our energy and how we do it. So the take up of low carbon solutions, and if you look at the yellow, orange, and um, well, the amber, orange, and yellow slide, uh, part of the slide there, you'll see that the take up of low carbon solutions is significant. On this diagram, you are looking at electrification increasing by 80% at the cost of gas being reduced by 80%. And as such, that gives you a good indication of which way the government and the country is going, looking at sustainable, clear energy. And you can also see in the blue, um, the expansion of low carbon energy. We're talking about um, increasing of wind, solar, renewable resources, and starting to introduce low carbon hydrogen as a solution as well. And the very bottom, you can see the natural carbon storage and greenhouse gas removals. The green is about more trees, more flora and fauna, the peatland, etc. Next, please. So what changes are we going to see? Now, these slides are, are telling us how much we've achieved at this moment in time. So in terms of carbon emissions, we're down 41% at 2020. But we've also got some key developments on the right hand side of the slide that show us that um, electric vehicle share is now at 13%. Um, boiler replacement is gone up to 11%. That's low carbon uh, domestic boiler replacements. Electricity, 205 terawatt hours, and that's the low carbon or green energy. And we're seeing uh, an increase in restoring peatland and afforestation. Next slide, please. You'll see by 2025, we've now moved on to a 50% reduction, and that's four years away. So we've got 7% to achieve, as Scott mentioned at the beginning. What's interesting here is that you're seeing some other developments happening. Meat consumption is going down by 9%. 4 million more households are going to be improved insulation. You're going to see electric vehicles up to nearly half of all vehicles on the road. You're looking at 31% of boilers being low carbon. Electricity has gone up 
to 238 terawatt hours and the first time you're going to see hydrogen coming in at one terawatt hour as such. So let's move on again please. So 2030 minus 64 percent we're seeing more reduction in meat eating we're seeing an increased number of insulations, again, helping to drive down energy usage. Electric vehicle shares going up to 97 because the government has said all sales of electric and diesel, of all petrol and diesel vehicles will be outlawed by 2030. We're seeing that electricity has been increased, the low carbon electricity up to 367 terawatt hours thousand terawatt hours. We're also seeing hydrogen at 30,000 terawatt hours and we're also starting to see the introduction of more forestry, more peatland being restored, but also some new perennial energy crops that are going to be used to help with energy supply. Next slide please. On this final slide here uh, for 2035 of this particular RAF, we're seeing that we've got nearly 25% reduction in meat consumption. We're looking at 14 million pounds worth of uh, 14 million homes with insulation fitted. We've moved right up to 100% of electric cars, 100% of boilers, we're talking about 485,000 terawatt hours, 106 terawatt hours of the hydrogen, 50,000 hectares per annum of afforestation, 19,000 hectares of energy crops, and 58% um, of peatland restored. And it, it's really interesting that we've hit as close to the 80% target in 2035. And the reason for that is, if we don't achieve what we need to do by 2035, we are gonna to struggle to hit our legislator target by 2050. And it's important that we recognize that this is just 14 years away. Next slide, please. So what does that look like? It means that low carbon technologies or fuels not affecting social behavioral changes equate to about 41% of what we're trying to do. But measures with a combination of low carbon technologies and so social and behavior changes at 43% and then largely social or behavior changes at 16% make up the lion's share. So this really is about us all looking individually at ourselves and what we're doing, not only about our businesses, but how the court of uh, consensus at the moment is more and more people are looking for environmental solutions. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to flip through this one quickly and the next one, principally because this is talking about £60 billion worth of investment at the peak. But if you show the next slide, please, it will show how that's being paid for through the offsets of savings and operating costs. All of these slides that I'm showing you are part of the um, Committee of Climate Change. Um, sixth carbon budget document which you'll find on the website so please do look at it for more detailed explanations next slide please the impact of innovation um, if we remember back in 2010 everybody was talking about solar panels and how they're going to make such a difference but the expense and the cost of them prohibited quite a few people but if you look in less than 10 years, the price has plummeted due to the cost of uptake. And this is exactly what is happening with the cost of green energy as well. So we're starting to see the more that the alternative sources are produced, the prices are coming down. Next slide, please. So 
how does this really affect us? Well, if we look at um, the regulation of the Environment Agency, they're about risk management and they manage the risk for the UK. But also they are seen as the leading player across the globe and have actually been advising China, for example, on the impacts of global warming and how it will affect um, in one scenario they looked at by the sea rising on their coastal areas there, it would put at risk over one billion people. So it is about looking at this globally as well. The EPRs, the Environmental Permitting Regulations, are basically um, a license to pollute, but they control who's allowed to do what as part of their management activities. They're looking at things called upstream prevention, uh, which is if you imagine all the mercury um, that comes through our facilities, um, a lot of that comes through from the dental practices. Now, if the dental practices change to get rid of all the amalgam and mercury, um, that have been put into people's teeth, and as people are living longer and retaining their own teeth, they would take out potentially the 15% of the UK's mercury emissions uh, at its death. So they're looking to act when needed. They want to protect and enhance the environment. They're keen to support society, and they're keen to support our economy through modern regulation working in partnership, looking at what needs to be done to achieve what happens. So they're also looking at regulatory stability. So you can really, I think, bank that this year we're going to see a raft of new regulations, guidance coming out just prior to COP26, because the UK is really pushing the world to actually focus on what needs to be done. But they want to do this in a way where it gives us long-term assurance. So we're not in a position to say, oh, yeah, but that's gonna change in a couple of years time. Next and last slide, please. So what about the Environment Agency and the bereavement sector? Well, obviously they're looking at our burial and cremation activities because they're looking at air quality, soil quality, water quality, and biodiversity. And obviously under part two, acti uh, the activity and the LAPPC uh, that local authorities run with DEFRA involvement, everybody's now starting to look about how we can pull things closer together. And instead of having individual organizations managing different levels, how we can bring it together in a focal point. Abatement, they're looking at again. Um, they want to look at what they can do more about mercury and level the playing field. The review of guidance that we're hoping to start at the beginning of the year has been postponed until um, there is a, a more stable picture in relation to COVID. But as I've said, they're looking for long-term resilience. We have a big debate to take on, which is about gas versus electric for crematoria and emissions is their watchword at the moment and from what we've heard from the speeches that have been given by Environment Agency this is going to be focused on more and more and more and I am sure there will be financial penalties coming in later if we're not able to achieve what needs to do. So the final comment and and this is a direct lift from the slide from the environment agency at our pre, um, launch presentation they say that if your business is sustainable and it's working in a, stand, a sustainable environment then it benefits everybody and not only the business is in harmony with the environment but it's in harmony with social and economical uh, uh, economic impacts as well. So thank you very much. And as I say, these slides um, have been lifted from 
the references that I'll make sure gets put up on the website for you. Thank you. Thanks, John. That's uh, very informative and uh, quite quite a challenge. So uh, let's hear from Julie Dunk and how we can start making a difference today. Julie. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Brendan, for inviting um, the ICCM onto this seminar. I think um, it's really important that this heralds the start of the new era of cooperation. Um, and certainly, you know, John just outlining what the Environmental Stewardship Group is all about um, also demonstrates that we can't go it alone. We have to work together as a sector to, uh, to tackle all these challenges. Um, if I could have the first slide, please, Scott. Thank you. Um, I want to talk briefly about how the ICCM has responded um, to environmental challenges over the years. Uh, and then I want to give you some ideas for, for sort of moving forward. So just to sort of recap briefly, um, in 1990, the idea of natural burial and alternative coffins was introduced by Ken West. So what's that, 30, 31 years ago now? And Ken then opened the first natural burial site in Carlisle in 1993. So, you know, we've had quite a long history um, of, of learning about the environment and about the funeral sector's impact on that environment. In 1996, the ICCM introduced the Charter for the Bereaved, which sets rights and targets for both customer care and also for environmental protection. So it was a really uh, useful document for looking at how authorities and businesses could actually um, adapt their services to make sure that they were protecting the environment um, as best as they could. In 2005, the ICCM supported 100% abatement to crematoria rather than adopting a um, paying to pollute policy. In 20 2007, the ICCM introduced the Recycling of Metals Following Information Scheme, which has been incredibly successful. We've raised over £10 million for charities and stopped lots of metal being treated uh, or being buried in, in grounds um, and also prevented the, uh, the mining of new ores for creating new metals. Um, if, if you're not in a recycling scheme of any sort, then please do join. Uh, it's, it's such a success. In 2009, uh, with the Burial Promotion Education Trust, we introduced the Carbon Footprint Scheme, which was designed to help assess our current carbon footprint and look at ways that we could reduce our carbon footprint. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Scott? Thank you. In 2011, we introduced recycling of floral tributes and plastics. And also in 2011, we introduced the holding over of coffins and cremation in a, in a way to um, maximize or sorry, minimize the use of gas. Um, and then in 2013, we amended our diploma to include a natural burial uh, unit. And we also introduced a natural burial charter at that time. In 2015, we looked at lowering the secondary chamber uh, for cremation from, 750, it's from 800 to 750 degrees which um, helps save an awful lot of gas. And since 1995, we've had lots of papers and journal articles on various aspects of the environment. Now, not all of the things that we've introduced have been universally popular. Um, some faced out and out hostility and they haven't all um, been as successful as we would like. However, I think going forward, um, some of the things that we have introduced will be taken up more and more. Currently, I think we need to look at some of the, the, the big wins, some of the um, figures that we've heard today from John and um, some of the initiatives from Brendan are great, you know, that we've got to have these big wins to get the carbon down to help protect the environment. But sometimes they may take quite a long time to introduce and they can be quite difficult for, for people to introduce. So. Here's just a few big wins that, you, that we, we need to be looking at. Um, first, I'd recommend adopting the Charter for the Bereaved. We are actually reviewing that at the moment. Um, so it will be relaunched later this year in a new format, um, but it will give you um, a direction of travel towards environmental protection. I think we also need to look at grounds maintenance. 
uh, as cemeteries and crematoria, we have very intensive ground maintenance regimes. We use a lot of diesel and petrol to, to achieve that. We tend to use pesticides and herbicides. We need to consider if that's the best approach. Some recent research has shown that bereaved people get more benefit from attending more environmentally friendly and more natural sites than from a, a manicured landscape. So there's a bit of research there to actually give us some incentive to look at our grounds maintenance regimes. Um, thinking about going electric, think about your fleet of vehicles, if you have vehicles and your grounds maintenance equipment um, to help reduce the, uh, the amount of diesel and petrol use, which will have an impact on um, carbon reduction. We need to think about pricing structure in terms of the polluter pays principle. Um, can we offer a reduction to the cost of burial or cremation if people choose a greener alternative? For example, a, a more eco-friendly coffin, could that attract an, uh, a reduction um, so that those choosing non-environmentally friendly um, materials actually pay more, like it, almost like a tax? And I think we do need to look at whether burial and cremation in its current form is sustainable. We've got to have these big conversations and we need to think about any alternatives that are coming along. Are they are they better for the environment? Um, you know, is, are they going to replace burial and cremation? So there's some big questions there, but some big wins if they can be introduced. Next slide, please, Scott. I think sometimes we can get a bit overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenge. Um, and it is quite overwhelming. You know, 14 years isn't very long. The fact is we've had probably since the 60s to actually start addressing some of the issues and we may have left it a little late in some cases, but um, we do really need to start acting now. If you can't achieve big wins, then we need to look at little wins. I, I like this quote. It's the greatest of all mistakes to do nothing because you can only do little do what you can. And I think that's really important. Um, if I can have the next slide, please, Scott. So I'm just going to give you um, 10 top tips for quick and easy wins, things you can do now, things that don't really cost a lot of money to implement um, and that will, will have an impact. It may seem that you're only doing a little thing yourself, but if lots of people do a little thing, that turns into a big thing. So First quick and easy win is to make sure you turn things off. Electricity is continued to be used when you leave your machinery in standby. So your TVs, your microwaves, your ovens, that sort of thing. Um, if you turn things off, you can save, but most, most families um, can save between 40 and 80 pounds a year in electricity by turning off, um, turning things off standby. It doesn't sound like a lot in itself, but if millions of people did that, that's a significant impact. Just a word of warning though, please don't turn your fridge or freezer off because um, then you'll have a, a, a big mess to deal with um, and that won't save any electricity in the long run. Um, second tip is rainwater harvesting. Very cheap, um, easy to install, but you can save gallons of water. You can use that water to water your, your gardens, um, your gardens of remembrance, your flower beds, your rose beds. Um, very, very, very cheap and simple solution. Composting, absolutely wonderful stuff, compost. Um, I could probably go on all day about the benefits of, of composting and soil um, and earthworms. Um, but basically, if you can compost your green waste, your flowers, your floral tributes, then you've got that compost to use in your grounds and your, your plants will be a lot better for it. Bird boxes. Our bird population is really suffering at the moment from loss of habitats through intensive farming. Cemeteries and crematoria can provide um, really useful spaces for birds. Um, so think about helping them out. Um, different birds need different bird boxes, but you can get local schools involved. You know, they make they like to, uh, to make the bird boxes um, and help place them in the grounds. The same for bats. Um, again, bat habitat is being eroded um, and they're struggling to find roosting sites. And again, cemeteries and crematoria can, can provide really good habitats for bats. So I encourage them onto your site through the placing of bat boxes. Next slide, please. Thank you. And the same for hedgehogs. 
hedgehogs are the nation's favourite mammal, um, but they are in serious decline, mostly again due to loss of habitat, and that tends to be because of um, large um, large housing estates that have individual gardens with no space for the hedgehog to get through. Hedgehogs need an awful lot of room to roam. They need to feed over a wide area. And by putting barriers in the way through garden walls and fences, you're really cutting down on a hedgehog um, on, on, their, uh, on their space, their roaming space. Cemeteries are wonderful places for hedgehogs, lots of uh, places they can, they can have habitats, but you do need to be careful if you're strimming or you're clearing an area, be careful that there's no hedgehogs nesting there. Try and avoid hedgehog nesting or hibernation season. Um, lots of information about hedgehogs on, on various websites. Wonderful creatures, please, let's help save them. In your site, you can create log piles and stone piles. These provide habitats for mini beasts and insects, which in turn then attracts lots of birds and mammals. Um, and that's cheap, easy to do. It's really important to recycle everything that we can. Ideally, we need to prevent or reduce our use, but if we can't do that, then we must recycle. Um, and it's got easier to do over the years. Um, so pretty much everything can be recycled now. And then planting trees and wildflowers, um, essential, help offset carbon and help um, attract pollinators. Ideally, sort of native wildflowers will help enormously um, to um, attract pollinators such as bees uh, and other insects. And again, that provides a food source for birds and mammals. And I think the final thing we need to do is spread the message. We need the public to, to be on side with this. Um, and I think, I think we need to give the public a lot of credit for being a lot more environmentally savvy than perhaps we think they are when it comes to funerals. You know, we need to make sure people know they have a choice and can make positive choices when it comes to ordering um, things like, you know, how, how, they, how do they get to the funeral? Do they need to arrive in a big limo? Um, can they you know, take themselves to the crematorium? So we need to have these sort of conversations. Um, open days are great. Tours around your facilities always attract a lot of people and a lot of interest, and that's a really good way of getting the message across. And also, um, if you produce in-house um, communications like magazines or newsletters, just keep putting positive messaging in. Anything that you do to help the environment, um, put it in there. Let's, let's get the message out there. Next slide, please, Scott. As I said earlier, small actions, small things that you do, taken all together results in big changes. Next slide, please. So we need to take those actions because we don't want the same fate as these guys. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks Judy for, for that. That was uh, very useful, very informative. Um, we, the panel have been very busy answering questions while they've been coming in, uh, but there are two or three that are, are still here. So uh, we've got a little bit of time left, so I'll see if we can pick these off. Um, it's a question, I guess this is really for John. Thinking about green tariff electricity, it obviously still has a CO2 impact. Given its environmental build cost, transmission and distribution, infrastructure, decommissioning, especially nuclear, do we know how these compare to gas, which currently is the favourite primary fuel for crematoria? John? Um, You're on mute. Yeah, no, I'm off now, thank you. Um, very, very interesting multifaceted question. Um, because there are several elements all rolled together in that. Um, the, the issue with respect to gas is gas is a fossil fuel. And it is, and as you said, you know, the primary fuel used by the industry, the, the crematoria. Um, the, the concern, and if you think about it, 
in a slightly different way. On average, each year, we are sending up into the atmosphere in excess of 120,000 metric tons of CO2. And that's just based on 247 kilograms of CO2 per body cremated. That doesn't include, obviously, when the cremators are in standby or warming up that are using gas, et cetera, et cetera. So ultimately, the big ticket item is, is about the messages that everybody's putting out is the moving away from gas to electric. We do know that obviously the cost of manufacturing some of these items, such as wind farms, etc., have um, an impact in terms of um, the energy required. But if you consider um, some of the, the biggest impact of emissions in the UK, um, apart from the generation of energy, which was coal, which is now moved away from that, is road transport or transportation full stop. And when I say transportation, I mean air cargo, I mean ship cargo, anything that's imported. So if you consider um, you know, things like coffins as a classic example, if you consider coffins, MDF, particle board, the resins, the glues, the formalin used in making those all have an impact, whether they're burnt or they're buried. If you look at the, the amount of embodied carbon in bringing in Chinese granite, um, you're talking about huge amounts of, of activity there. And one of the things that you'll find being talked about soon is circular economies and natural um, resources that we have. And why don't we consider things like local stone? You imagine if we could actually, instead of quarrying abroad um, in very unusual circumstances for some children or bonded labor and transporting it halfway around the world. Do you imagine if we could actually do something with the UK's natural capital and, and we could provide things here in terms of new job, rural activities uh, and an improvement for the economy. But what I will do is um, whoever sent that question in, if Scott lets me have a copy of it, I'll give you a more formal uh, considered a response um, outside of this environment. Thanks, John. Um, I think we've come pretty much there in terms of time. Obviously, all of the questions that have been raised, uh, we will actually put a, a response to all of those when we circulate the recordings. Um, but for now, uh, I think it's now time to uh, close off today's event. So. Thanks again for joining us. I hope that you found this session beneficial. Uh, take a look at the Open Centre website, a blog section. You'll find several informative articles which relate to not just today's topic, but several others. Uh, we are running a series of events over the coming months. So again, please take a look and register. The next two in this series are actually listed here. Um, and we will be sharing links with these with you as well. Um, as I've said, we will be distributing recordings of today's events in the coming days. So please feel free to share these links to your colleagues. Uh, it is a subject that uh, affects everybody and we all need to have a, uh, a hand in, in the resolution. So once again, thank you everybody. <laughs>